World War I, the age of trench warfare. Twenty million men fought in a labyrinth of trenches and underground tunnels, enough to circle the globe. Many soldiers never left the battlefields, their bodies and weapons swallowed by the earth. Now, a team of historians and archaeologists have come to excavate the frontline trenches. This muddy ground contains clues to a mystery. How did these trenches make World War I so hard to win? This is a, a British Lee Enfield rifle. This is a, a standard British Bulldog Spade. The evolution of trench warfare is an evolution of technology. For the next 10 days, the team will reveal the hidden traces of the trenches and the men who fought, lived, and died in them. Outside the city of Ypres lie Belgium's famous Flanders fields. This tranquil farmland was once one of the bloodiest battlefields of World War I. Some of the war's first trenches were dug here, creating a new kind of warfare. This land became the crucible of the war, where men died for advances measured in yards, not miles. Today, long stretches of trenches still lie here, hidden beneath the ground. But now, the town of Ypres is mounting a new kind of invasion. Urban sprawl is threatening to pave over these historic battlefields. The last reminders of the agony of this war will soon be lost forever. So, to save the past, a team of archaeologists has come to dig up the trenches before they disappear for good. Among them, the Flemish Heritage Institute's lead archaeologist, Mark de Vilde. It must be possible to protect some of these sites because they are very well preserved, they're very valuable. This real evidence of inhumanity, if you like, this, this war that took place 90 years ago. No one is sure how much they'll find or whether 90 years of mud and erosion has destroyed whatever might remain of the war. The team has allotted themselves just 10 days to dig before the Belgian winter sets in, but no one is sure if they are digging in the right spot. Hoping their research will pay off, they begin excavating where they think the German front line should be. Okay, just walking up to no man's land. Mm -hmm. To interpret the finds, the team will need the help of world-class experts, like military historian Peter Barton. Yeah. The lines are going to cross this field right here. An authority on virtually every aspect of underground combat. High ground, yes. On the slightly high ground, and all the British lines are down in the hollow. Uh, I've never experienced an archaeological dig like this before, where you're opening up at the same time uh, the German front line and the British front line, with the team working on both digs at the same time. First, a shallow strip is dug, 50 meters long. What we're doing just here is taking the topsoil off and revealing the subsoil. And here, the metal detectorists are moving in to try to find the, any ferrous deposits. These could be barbed wire pickets, they could be bullets, they could be shells, unexploded shells. We believe that this section here is the trench which was in place from May 1915 until the beginning of the Third Battle of Ypres. So this was the German front line. Soon, the first relic of the war. Hey, Frankie's holding an 18-pounder shrapnel shell. It's off fish mm -hmm. What would have been inside it are many hundreds of these small balls. These little balls are thrown out of the shell into the faces of the oncoming troops. Uh, this was really one of the ultimate 
killers because this thing would make a, an entry wound that big, but because it's made of lead, would spread inside your body and make an exit wound the size of a, a dinner plate. At the onset of the war, the Allies were at the mercy of German artillery. Sandbags and shallow pits provide little protection. Shrapnel rained down from the sky, and the Allies had nowhere to hide. In August 1914, the German army cut a swath through North Belgium en route to France. Their goal was Paris, but they were pushed back by Allied forces. By the end of 1914, the armies faced off along a vast front, with the Allies clinging to the city of Ypres. Because of the, the amount of bloodshed which took place on these fields here, the British also came to believe if, that if Ypres was lost, then the war could very well have been lost as well, and the empire was in huge danger. Just on the outskirts of modern Ypres, the search for the British trench begins. It's dangerous work. There are certain to be live shells. So the team gets a crash course on how to deal with live artillery and deadly gas shells. Frankie is putting in a uh, gas flag. So everyone on site knows where, in which direction the wind is blowing. In case we hit a gas shell or something like that, uh, we know what direction we should evacuate. With the topsoil removed, remnants of the war begin to appear. Peter Barton helps identify the artifacts. Frankie's digging away here, and he's pulling up lots and lots of used, fired Mauser rounds, which is a Mauser's the German machine gun bullet. The German army was the first to see the deadly potential of machine guns. They laid waste to Allied soldiers. The twin power of machine gun bullets and shrapnel shells left Allied infantrymen outgunned and desperate for cover. In a letter home, a soldier writes, There's screaming bits of hot metal flying all over, and machine guns going in pandemonium all around. You get down to get cover. You can't get your nails into the ground, and you can't get your head underground. You can't get down because you can't go any further. How the devil do you get out of that unscathed? Sergeant Bill Hay, Royal Scots. Soldiers have nowhere to go but deeper into the ground. The evolution of trench warfare is an evolution of technology. We're seeing trenches in the early stages of the war just being simple scrapes in the ground, not being intended in any way to be permanent. Trenches simply appeared in this landscape because men had to take cover from steel, from bullets and from shrapnel. It's as simple as that. Only four months into the Great War, the British alone have lost 60,000 men. Shallow pits have become death traps. Something has to change, and soon. On the right. Now, the team will find answers. This is the, uh, the first duck vault we've uncovered. They're about to find evidence of one of the biggest massings of men in armament the world has ever seen. An historic excavation in Flanders Fields is revealing evidence of what sent soldiers scurrying for cover during World War I. Shrapnel and machine gun fire set into motion the beginning of trench warfare along the Western Front. The trenches were filled in at the end of the war, gladly erased. 
But now, on day two of the dig, there's no clear sign of any trenches. Where the German trench should be, a patch of discolored earth offers a clue. It may be a filled-in trench or shell hole. And that's where you're gonna dig in the dark floor. Yeah, all in dark. Some small sections to see how deep it goes. Yeah. 100 meters away, the team is still looking for signs of the British front line. The archaeologists have taken the surface off and they clean the surface. And what we're finding now, the very first finds, the very first artifacts which appear at this, at this time. A much more personal item here, a tunic button, a British standard issue tunic button. And of course the uh, ubiquitous shrapnel bullet, which we've already seen so many of just in the last few hours. Here in the trench lines of Belgium, what you're going to be finding are hundreds and hundreds, thousands even, of these kinds of bullets. What brings to your attention, what really shocks you in some ways, is the fact that as people are going about their business, farming here, walking across, they're walking across live ammunition, they're walking across grenades, they're walking across gas shells. This is, this is a, what's known as a Mark 7 infantry bullet. This was the standard bullet that was fired from the Lee Enfield rifle. Uh, this is a, a position from which um, rifle bullets are fired regularly in great mass. And you can imagine that this kind of thing was done a stand to every morning. The soldiers would get up, they would remind the Germans, and the Germans would remind the British and Canadians and other guys that you know, they were still there. To find the Allied trench, the team digs deeper into the clay. Ironically, the first thing revealed by the team's shovels is a shovel. This is a, a standard British bulldog spade. I mean, these are still made today. Uh, British troops in Iraq are probably carrying these right now. And this is uh, perhaps one of the best spades for this action. It's got an open mouth. And this is the day-to-day -day piece of kit that would be necessary to dig these trench lines. By late 1914, with thousands of shovels issued to troops, both armies dug in, and the Western Front was born. Both sides simply put down their rifles, picked up their spades, and began entrenching. The spade took the place of the rifle. Put that you didn't need your rifle anymore, you just needed to get cover, and entrench, and entrench, and entrench. Those trenches are still here, somewhere. The trick is finding them. As the second day wears on, the team again checks 90-year-old trench maps and aerial photographs, trying to pinpoint where they should dig. Yes, yes. And he, he worked, he was the German officer which uh, worked on some of the trenches. If they're digging in the right spot, they'll find signs of the Allied trenches and across no man's land, the German line. You've got to approach this very optimistically. You don't know what you're going to find, but it nearly always surprises you. Finally, a breakthrough. What we've got here is a huge relief. They find telltale markings of an Allied trench. This is the, uh, the first duck vault we've uncovered. I mean, there were worries earlier that uh, perhaps the whole of the trench and the infrastructure had been removed, but it hasn't. The duck board was designed to keep your feet out of the water. So the duck boards actually held you off the ground and they kept your feet dry. Absolutely key uh, aspect of uh, First World War.
Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great thrill. It seems a bit stupid getting excited over duck boards, but I am. <laughs> this particular duck board gives us a, a, an important piece of information because we can see which way it's oriented. So the man would stand on it like this. And this probably means if this is the front line, then this was the fire bay. In fact, what I'm standing in here, it's hard to believe, but this is, it's not only the front line of this part of the Western Front on Pilkham Ridge, this is the front line of the British Empire. The duck boards mean the team has finally identified the Allied front line. The German line should be 100 meters away. Duck boards were invented so the Allies could fight a second enemy, water. The water table controlled all trench depth, wherever you were on the Western Front, but especially in this area where it was so close to the surface. Soldiers dug trenches for safety, but what they find is water. The aquifer lies just four feet below the surface. Worse still, the clay soil traps every drop of rain. Trenches become ditches. In early 1915, heavy rain added to the soldiers' misery. A Canadian soldier describes the frustration of digging on the front line. It was very bad weather while we occupied the trenches. The continuous rain making it very muddy and also doing great damage to the parapets. Each morning we would find part of the trench given way. And during the day, the company were kept busy building it up again. Private John F. Mould. As one old soldier said, you know, you can get these things into the ground, you can get the soil onto the spade, but you can't get it off. It sticks and it adheres, and you can see just how difficult it is even now to, to remove that material. German soldiers had less trouble. Their trenches were high and dry. The reason why the, the German trenches are higher is because they chose to put them there at the beginning of the war. They deliberately move forward onto the high ground or pull back onto the high ground. They didn't mind going back as long as they're on high ground during the winter. So what we've got here is, is the Germans on a slightly higher contour, a drier contour, and that means they can pump the water out of their trenches and it flows down into the British trenches. Duck boards provide only partial comfort from the wet. Many soldiers who escape German bullets become victims of the great curse of the war, trench foot. Trench foot was something which you got if your feet were constantly in water. Your feet literally started rotting away. You could get gangrene and you'd have to have to amputate. With toes falling off, doctors initially mistake the condition for frostbite. But this curse lasts all year. In one case, a single battalion had 400 men struck down with trench foot. In many cases, the only cure was to amputate. Despite the conditions, British orders were to hold the line at any cost. The British were told to stay in the position in which they last came to rest. And commanders in the field would say, but this is a terrible position. We're in a bog here, sir, you know. And it, they said, no, that is it. You stay where you are, you dig in there. The British do not go back. Britain's refusal to draw back created one of the most exposed positions of the Western Front, the Ypres salient. Here, the Allied line bulged out into enemy territory. From the high ridges around Ypres, Germany fired on Allied soldiers from the front, both sides, and behind. For the Allies, the geography of the salient was a tactical nightmare. This area, the Ypres salient, was the, uh, the cauldron, the crucible, really, of the, uh, the Western Front for the British forces and all the other, what we might call, colonial forces, if you like. Forces from all over the world came and fought in these very trenches which we're excavating here. As winter turned to spring of 1915, tens of thousands of reinforcements were heading to the front lines. They came looking for glory, adventure, or escape. 
but they all shared an ignorance of the horrors that await them in the trenches of the Eper salient. The team is about to uncover signs of the bizarre world that soldiers would find here. This was their, their home, their life. A world where everything seemed designed to maim or kill. This is First World War, by the In the spring of 1915, new fighting men flooded into Belgium's now infamous battlefields. They traveled from the furthest reaches of the Commonwealth, from Australia, New Zealand, India, and Canada. Hundreds of thousands of men had volunteered to live, kill, and die in the trenches of the Western Front. Now, day three of the dig, Archaeologists are uncovering signs of the soldiers' strange new home. So we're beginning to see the, uh, the evolution of this trench system. We can see the straight sections, we can see the fire bay here, we can see the traverse back again. So those shapes which we saw on the aerial photographs, we're actually beginning to see them on the ground now. This, it's, it's taking shape into precisely the uh, uh, the kind of structure which the, the soldiers fought in during the war. The trenches wound continually around sharp corners and it was absolutely necessary to keep in touch in order to avoid taking the wrong turning. If one stopped for a moment, it was easy to lose sight of the man in front. Thus, we would be pounding along at a killing pace with our heavy equipment swinging and clattering, stumbling and cursing in the darkness as far as our breaths allowed. Private Frederick Elias Nunes. These are the boards which tens of thousands of men from all over the world would have walked on, the trenches they would have lived in. This was their, their home, their life. It, they were almost exiled here, they were here for so long. It was an alien world, this. Uh, things were done completely differently. You could forget everything you ever knew in the civilian life. And from that point onwards, once you moved into the trenches, you became a troglodyte soldier. You didn't live in houses, you lived in holes in the ground. You would have the smell of bare earth, the smell of damp earth. You had the smell of decay, the smell of human decay. And that was something which they had to get used to. New arrivals soon found that their first task was not to fight, but to dig, to build the most sophisticated trench system the world had ever seen. This was a military engineer's war. They were responsible for not only designing and building the trench system, but for everything else, the whole of the infrastructure. Whatever you pick up in this trench will have been designed. Nothing at all was random. There was no random evolution in, in trench warfare. As soldiers dug down, muddy walls would cave in and wash out. But the Royal Engineers had a solution, and the team finds evidence of it a meter below the surface. We've got into the fine detail of trench construction here now. These are the A-frames, which both held apart the, the trench sides. You can see these would have extended further up here, holding those um, steel revetments in place, stopping the trench collapse. And on top of the A-frames, your duckboard went to, sat on the top of those A-frames there. The water would pass underneath so that any water that came into the trench would sit below the level of the, of the duckboard, so it kept your feet dry. Absolutely critical part of trench warfare. This is an indication of how the British and Commonwealth armies tried to bring regularity to what they saw here, to build new technologies, to invent things like the A-frame trench systems. The British and the you know, Commonwealth allies were trying to command that piece of ground. Here. 
the archaeologists now have uh, gone below the surface and it's at this point where the trench warfare starts coming alive. Uh, it's, a, it's a pipe. So we're beginning to personalise the trenches. Here's a significant piece of trench material. This is telephone wire. And these trenches, although they're clear of it now, would have been festooned with this stuff. And in fact, um, as you were walking through, people would be shouting, where wire, where wire, meaning beware of the wire, because this stuff was everywhere. Within just a few months, improvised rifle pits had evolved into a vast underground fortress. All the forests in southern England were cut down from Canada, from the United States. Wherever they could get timber, there's always a shortage of timber. They were always on the edge of running out. Soldiers construct 10,000 miles of trenches. Soon, enough trenches have been dug to circumnavigate the globe. But no trench was ever completely safe. Project leader, Mark de Vilde. It, it uh, seems that there has been an explosion here because all, you see all the pieces of wood and, 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 and metal and, and so on. So it seems that there has been an explosion and that's why the, the duck boards and so on have disappeared. One hundred meters across no man's land, the team finally finds signs of the German trench. Look at the effort here. Here in the German trench, we can see the German style. They used A-frames the same as we did, but they put planks, heavy planks, longitudinally. Interesting here because we can see the depth. It's what, two and a half, three feet from the ground surface. Much more shallow than the British Trench on the other side of no man's land. So on the surface, they built these massive, very, very imposing breastwork structures to make it, the British feel even more looked down upon. So it's a, it's a very important uh, learning process we're going through here. Terrific dig. The Germans create a highly sophisticated trench system, admired even by officers. I am astonished about the ongoing work here in the trench. The battalion feels they have done everything that was possible. Despite the heavy artillery attack during the last few days, the sniper steps and armrests have been set up everywhere. Obstacles were put in place, parapets were made higher, and entanglements were mended. Hauptmann Rudolf Lange. As the war escalates, engineers try to turn their trenches into impregnable fortresses. To help, they modify a familiar farm tool. In front of these trenches, there would be, at the beginning of the war, very, very simple uh, barbed wire defenses. Some, at the beginning, simply one single strand of wire, and that gave them a terrific feeling of security, a one single strand. Later in the war, you had immensely dense entanglements. They may have come all the way out here to where I'm standing. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. This is First World War barbed wire. That's, that's proper barbed wire. It's not agricultural. Barbed wire was just the first line of defense. Behind it lay the fire trench. Further back, support trenches would hold reserve troops during attacks. Perpendicular communication trenches link up the lines, allowing men, messengers, and munitions to travel to and from the front. As trench fortresses developed, neither side could move. This standoff became known as mutual siege. Trying to break through enemy lines became almost suicidal. 
the team is about to find weapons designed for this strange new stage of the war. This is a sniper's plate. They'll also find the soldiers who died fighting it. In an historic first, archaeologists are excavating two frontline trenches of World War I, one German, one Allied. Day five is the team's halfway point. Well, this is a, a typical survivor of the trench warfare. It's, it's a rifle, it's a British Lee Enfield rifle. This rifle was uh, designed and developed in the early part of the 20th century and was used right the way through to the Second World War. It's a mainstay of all Commonwealth and British troops that were engaged here. It's very characteristic. These rifles have a, a snub nose, which is uh, very typical. And we can see that this is, this is where the nozzle would be. This is the position of the business end, if you like. This is where the trigger would be. This is where the bolt was. So this is, as the soldier would draw back the bolt in order to load this. So the big question would be, what is this? Now this is a bit unusual. It's not something that is commonly seen in Lee Enfield rifles. And it's quite possible that this represents the housing for a sniper scope. Even in an underground fortress, no one is safe. It was particularly dangerous for young soldiers or soldiers who just arrived in the line, never been in the line before. And uh, there are many accounts of this where they say, well, where is this war? And they just put their head above the, the parapet. Bang. Pratt was hopeless. His head was shattered. Splatterings of brain lay in the pool under him, but he refused to die. Old Corporal Welch looked after him, held his body in arms as they writhed and fought feebly as he lay. It was over two hours before he died, his voice gurgling and moaning low and dry, a death rattle fit for the most bloodthirsty novelist. British officer John Carrington. And when you hear the reports that it was all quiet on the Western Front, quite often there were these individual tragedies as people went past those frontline positions and were picked off by these fixed rifles. Each month, 30,000 men died along the Western Front without any battles being launched. Military officials accepted this number, calling it natural wastage. For both sides, snipers are a constant threat. The Germans are 120 meters away. For a sniper with a telescopic sight, that's absolutely nothing. 400 meters is nothing. Five, 600 meters, they could drill you through your forehead at 600 meters. These were the, the top marksmen. It only took a single shot to kill. Digging deeper into the history of the war, the team finds one of the tricks of the sniper's trade. This is a sniper's plate. No, it wouldn't normally sit flat on the ground like that. It would be in the, the British breastwork. There's a hole in the middle, and that's where you would have put your rifle through to snipe at any movement in the German lines, just across no man's land there. The peculiar little feature uh, on the top is actually, it's like a window. You close that when you'd finished firing, otherwise they would be able to see a little light source through it. Uh, we can see, looking at this plate, that it's, oh, it's a good inch thick, solid steel. And that was designed specifically to stop a, um, a, a German bullet, uh, so that the sniper was safe behind there, the British sniper was safe behind his plate. However, 
um, they did devise other methods to actually pierce those. And this is not with armor piercing bullets, but simply by reversing the bullet in the cartridge so that the point end is into the bullet and the, the, the end which is being fired is the blunt end. It's British, so it's been fired at the German lines. These are very, very rare. The reason why they're so rare is because they were made by the soldiers themselves. These were not standard issue. In fact, they may have been against the, the rules of war. Now, this would hit that with such energy that it would possibly not go through it, but what it would do, it would burst a little bit of steel, fragments of steel, off the back of the sniper plate. And they, they would spray into the sniper's face. As time passed, they found other ways of dealing with uh, snipers, and this was one of the most popular. It's designed by the Royal Engineers. They actually des designed a, uh, a fake head, which was pretty solid, so that when a, a German sniper's bullet passed through the head, it would drill a tight hole. You would then bring the head down and put a periscope through the hole and then take it back up again, exactly the same distance you brought it down, look through the periscope, and that would take your eye line straight to where the enemy sniper had fired from. He would not be sniped back at, he would be trench mortared. You got the trench mortars onto him, or the artillery even, and just plastered that area, and that, that literally uh, uh, sent it to oblivion. As methods of finding and destroying enemy marksmen improved, the number of deaths by sniping fell sharply. first sign of human remains. It'll take some time to excavate this because it's almost done forensically. The finding of human remains on the battlefield now is taken possibly more serious than it ever has been before. The bones are found two meters in front of the British trench. Archaeologist Yannick de Heysa is in charge of disinterring the remains. This is a piece of his leg. This is the pelvis we have. Probably this is his other leg. Um, we have no sign of skull yet. Um, you can ask the question whether there's going to be a skull. The find triggers a strict protocol, and the first order of business is to determine what killed this man. The prime suspect is shell fire a leading cause of death during the war. The maiming and the, the agony which some of these men went through, particularly from shell fragments, where they could just be torn in half. Shards of steel from the shell casing which could quite just take your arm off, take your head off, cut you in half, just take you to pieces. As Yannick cleans away 90 years of mud, a new mystery emerges. So the problem is now whether we're dealing here with one skeleton or with more skeletons. Why would these men be buried just in front of a British trench? The answer will open one of the most horrific chapters in the history of trench warfare. It's day five, and in the hunt for the traces of World War I, archaeologists on the British front line have uncovered human remains. But as team member Yannick de Heysa digs out the skeleton, she makes a remarkable discovery. We cleaned the area a little bit further and we had to change our theory a little bit. Uh, now we don't have one skeleton anymore, but we have not two skeletons, but even three skeletons. The remains are not in a trench, but in front of one. 
we've also discovered that these skeletons, they're laying in a shell hole. Most bodies are found in, in shell holes, not in trenches, because they've cleared the trenches, because they had to use them. As the trench lines expanded, they had to expand, of course. It was certainly not uncommon to, to be digging away and extending your trenches and run into, similar to what we found here, a shell hole, which had been used as a, a mass grave. During battle, it was hard to create cemeteries. The simple act of extending a trench could lead to horrifying discoveries. Under fire, corpses couldn't be properly moved. It was a grisly task. But soldiers dug on, and the dead were entombed in mud once more. Ninety years later, the team must discover the cause of death. What happens is that we call our uh, physical anthropologist. She comes over here. Take them out. She looks at the skeleton. Yeah, they're very well preserved, yes, indeed. And that's because of the environment, the soil. She can um, determine the, the age of the skeleton. Um, she looks at all his diseases. Um, sometimes she can look at the leg and see whether he's um, a cavalryist or not. Sometimes we have uh, young men about 18 or 20, but I have the impression this man is a bit older. But it's too soon. These remains deserve a proper final burial. But which nation should take them home? Yannick finds a clue. We also found two buttons here. And if you look at the buttons, you can see on the button, it's, it's very difficult to see, but if you, if you clean it up a bit, you can see a burning flame on one of the buttons. And burning flames are typical for French costumes, for French uniforms. So this could tell us something about the nationality of the person um, lying here. So we think it's a, it's a French soldier. So this guy, this man here, this, uh, he has his hand nicely put, his uh, left hand on the pelvis. Which gives me the impression he has been placed here in that position. He did not just fall. The French buttons, the three bodies, the deliberate burial. The evidence suggests a chilling explanation of what happened here. The anthropologists and the um, archaeologists, from the way that these three soldiers are lying, they believe these three men may well be victims of the very first cloud gas attack of the war. In the spring of 1915, French troops held the forward line, two miles east of where the archaeologists are now excavating. But on the evening of April 22nd, the lines were about to shift. The gas was released from behind German lines over to our right, about two miles away near Langemark. And what they needed was a northerly wind for that gas, and it took a long time in coming. But they got the north wind on the evening of April the 22nd, 1915. They had tubes going out into no man's land, which uh, and when they unscrewed the cap, the gas was re released from those tubes. They released 40,000 cylinders. It came crawling across this field, a sort of a blue-green uh, haze. Heavier than air, chlorine gas sank into the Allied trenches. This area was held at the time by French Algerian troops. They didn't know what it was. Nobody knew what it was. It rolled across these fields and utterly stupefied, terrified, and killed the French Algerian troops. Within minutes, hundreds died. 
Others fled their posts in terror. A whole section of the Allied line broke and ran. British officers were outraged that colonial troops were retreating. In vain, they ordered the soldiers to return to the line, but slowly realized that they were fighting a horrifying new kind of weapon. You get a strong dose and it gets into your lungs. It destroys the nervous system from the inside. And what you actually do is you drown from within. Your lungs fill with liquid and you literally just simply drown without being underwater. A terrible way to die. Over a four mile front, 168 tons of chlorine gas was released, piercing a massive hole in the Allied line. Wearing primitive masks, the Germans attacked while Canadian troops rushed in to close the gap. 2,000 Canadians died halting the advance, and the front line was pushed back nearly two miles. And this is the precise spot where that German attack was held. From that day, which was in May 1915, until July the 31st, 1917, so over two years, these lines remained fixed. There was not a millimeter of movement. When the battle ended, the bodies of hundreds of French colonial troops were recovered and buried in shell holes close to the new Allied front line. Germany's attempt to gas the enemy and take Ypres had failed. Both sides were again locked in stalemate. But for a few fallen soldiers, this battle wasn't quite over. Now they finally have a chance to go home. The archaeological team feel a sense of obligation for the soldiers they've found. You're not dealing with a skeleton, but you're dealing with a real person. And that makes it very worth um, excavating them and getting them out so they can have a proper burial at last. The names of these soldiers are still unknown, but thanks to the work of the archaeologists, they can be turned over to the French army, joining the ranks of the thousands of men who gave their lives in the trenches of Flanders fields. So full honors are given. They're treated with the greatest possible respect from the moment they're found until the moment they're buried. As the bodies are readied for repatriation, the team resumes its work digging deeper into the trenches. Yeah, we've got the German machine gun position marked exactly in the trench where we are here. They'll find signs of desperate new strategies for breaking through the lines. Trench raids were considered ludicrously costly because you always had casualties, you always had death. Each side knew that to win the war, they had to find a way to end the stalemate. The archaeologists will soon find out how both sides tried new, horrific methods to break the enemy. In Belgium's Flanders fields, a team of archaeologists are excavating two frontline trenches of the First World War. The Allied trench has revealed dozens of artifacts, pointing to each stage of trench warfare. But at the German trench, Five days of digging reveals only signs of destruction. My first impression is it's a fragment of hand grenade. After cleaning, we've got the German bike helmet. 
The team thinks the German trench was crushed under heavy artillery fire. But what would have made this spot such an important target? Exactly the same for the Germans. They sat there for two years. That's right. Peeking into each other. Historian Peter Barton calls on the help of Peter Chasso, a military historian and cartographer. In the first place. It's certainly hard to believe there was several fierce battles here and in They head across no man's land. Try and get over to help solve the mystery of the blasted German trench. We're in the German trench again. We've got concrete work here. And judging by the position on Peter's map, it's quite possibly pretty, it's very, very close to the spot where the, we seem to have a machine gun marked. Yeah, we've got certainly on the trench map a German machine gun position marked exactly in the trench where we are here. The position of this machine gun post may illustrate another tactic of the trenches. Salients were bulges in the line, allowing forces to almost surround the enemy. But on a smaller scale, salients could create a different advantage. Archaeological field technician Frankie Weifels. And I'm, I'm certain to say that from here, the front line runs from here, a shelter, probably machine post, runs on. Another shelter that runs on about more than 30 meters, makes a 90 degree turn right. That's the front line on the west. We've got the front line facing no uh, south. The destroyed machine gun post that the team has found was located in a small bulge in the German line. This allowed it to fire in a broad swath into no man's land. The most dangerous thing in Nomazan was the fixed machine gun. What they would do is fix a machine gun on a line just to cut, almost cut the grass in no man's land, knee height. By day, stepping into no man's land was suicide. So soldiers started working the night shift. Operations would begin just after dark. Each night, all along the front, hundreds of soldiers would crawl out of the trenches. It was the only time barbed wire could be repaired. But German machine guns were always on guard. Working in silence became a matter of life or death. At the beginning of the war, barbed wires hung on posts, and this was a very dangerous thing at night because you had to hammer these posts into the ground. And that, the noise could be picked up by enemy machine gunners. And they would just spray the area when they heard that activity going on. The telltale sound of men working the wire got thousands killed until the British borrowed an enemy solution. It's called a screw picket, a German invention which was taken up immediately by the British. And the reason why it was taken up is because this, unlike the timber stakes, was silent in its application. So all you did was you placed the point in the ground and started turning, just like a corkscrew. And once that was in, you just attached your wire to it, to the loops up here, put as many as these in as you wanted without making a sound. But fixing barbed wire wasn't the only reason to leave trenches at night. Darkness was also a perfect time to spy on the enemy. Spy planes could only do so much. They were too high to see new machine gun nests and fortifications. Sometimes, the only answer was to take a close look in person. And trench raids were the answer. Invented in early 1915, the objective was to infiltrate a German trench, kill the enemy, and escape with at least one live prisoner to ply for intelligence. One soldier chronicled his terrifying experience on a trench raid in 1915. Don't look back. 
We muffled our rifle slings and accoutrements so that no little noise should betray us. The last thing we did before going out was to give each other a stiff dose of rum. Then there were a few whispered farewells and a handshake or two. As soon as we passed our entanglements, we got down on our bellies and began to crawl. In the slow advance to the enemy's line, I experienced a prolonged state of consciousness during which I hung over a pit of fear, weighted down by a long and vivid anticipation. This silent agony of deliberate approach. Captain Herbert Reed. Out in no man's land, the raiders wait for their chance to strike. They don't dare move as long as German machine guns are in place. For the raid to succeed, this target must be destroyed. Now back at the site, Barton and Chasso believe they know why this section of the German trench was destroyed. Yeah, what we got here is a trench map prepared uh, for a, a British trench raid. We know from, from this plan that in early 1917, they executed this raid. It, it happened right here on this spot, and that German machine gun in place up there was targeted by the British 4.5-inch howitzers very specifically uh, to destroy or neutralize that machine gun post so that it couldn't fire across no man's land and knock out this British raiding party that was coming across. The raiders readied themselves for the attack waiting for Allied shells to obliterate the machine gun nests. With the machine gun nest destroyed, the raiders could launch their attack. French raids could be very, very bloody. They were, for the information which they gained, they were later, after the war, considered ludicrously costly because you always had casualties, you always had death, and very often you discovered very little. With survival rates as low as 50%, thousands were injured or died in these trench raids. No one could win the war this way. Both sides continued to search for a way out of the trenches. And as archaeologists will soon discover, stalemate sent the trench fighters even deeper underground. There's a sense here that it might be some kind of trench shelter. And created an engineering marvel. With the war locked in stalemate, in the winter of 1916, German and Allied soldiers hunkered down in their trenches, worn out by boredom, cold, and the threat of sudden death. Heavy gales sprang up during the two nights, and it was the coldest we had experienced in the firing lines. The men often coming in again, with the rations being nearly frozen. Private John F. Mould. Across no man's land, Germans endured the same hardships. The war was defined by boredom, punctuated by moments of terror. There was no telling when the Allies might launch a trench raid or an artillery attack. I shall not easily forget those long winter nights in the front line. In the dark, we were prey to all sorts of unreasoning fancies. A tree stump, a hammock of earth, a coil of wire took on a new and menacing forms and in the light of a star shell could seem to be moving towards us. Private Frederick Elias Knox. 
The soldiers had expected to be home by Christmas 1914, but the war was dragging on with no end in sight. Now, the dig discovers how these cold trenches were made into a home away from home. We have a, a rectangular feature over there. The first impression looking at this is that we've got a, an area which is roughly square shaped. It's, it's got fabric, it's got timber, and there's a sense here that it might be some kind of trench shelter. Once it was clear that the war would last not for months, but years, millions of men needed a home in this land of water and mud. This was the job of the Royal Engineers for the British and the job of the pioneers, or pioneer, for the Germans. It was their job to devise the trench systems so men could live in it. This was a home. What we're looking at here is not just a trench, it's where men lived. An underground metropolis took root behind the trenches. Up to 3,000 men lived and slept in each section. Engineers rigged kitchens and latrines. A military base with all the amenities but one, sunlight. In fact, more people lived underground in 1917 in the Ypres salient than live on the surface now in the city of Ypres. Today, only relics are left of the men who lived here. That's a, that's a standard uh, British boom. <laughs> it's rubber. Yeah. Appears to be a bottle of tonic. These were very, very popular. Many, many uh, varieties of this to treat whatever ailments you got in the trench. Many of these things treated everything you could possibly get from trench foot to, uh, to hair loss. So we're, we're getting some evidence of home from home here in the trenches. So I, th I think we're looking at a position occupied probably not by ordinary soldiers, but by officers, by NCOs. For some officers, like Second Lieutenant Robin Skeggs, living conditions were even sometimes enjoyable. My dear Granny, I'm writing this sitting in my garden at the back of my dugout. It's a lovely afternoon. We've laid a certain amount of turf already, and as I write, there are three youngsters around me, as busy as they know how. They thoroughly enjoy doing a bit of gardening for the officer. Who would like my garden seat? Sheltered from the wind in a snug little corner which gets the sun all day. Lower ranks have fewer creature comforts. Everything was very carefully designed, just like the civilian social structure. Offices, the higher classes were separated from the men, from the, uh, the great unwashed. And this was absolutely true in trench warfare. It was comfortable down there too. You couldn't hear the shelling. It was always warm because you had so many bodies there. But um, the overriding thing was the stench of unwashed men, which, uh, it, it, well, I can't even visualize it, but so many people talk about this horrific stench as you go down the stairs into the dugout. It's, oh. The next discovery provides another glimpse of life underground. It's a, it's a dump of candles. Unused candles, if you look at the shape of the candle here. Everywhere. Candles did more than keep out the darkness. They were an important weapon in the war on lice. The trick was to sizzle the lice hiding in the seams before burning a hole in your trousers. But nothing could equal the comforts that came from home. 
A parcel from home could mean so much. Parcels and letters were hugely important in the trenches. If families could afford to send parcels, then they would send uh, huge amounts of food of all kinds, delicacies, sweet foods, cakes, fruit. Uh, everything could be posted. You found, uh, you know, officers having pâté de foie, mince pies at Christmas time. It wasn't uncommon at all. You find lists of parcel contents, and there's one here. And we've got a tin of cocoa, a tin of tomato soup, and the, the recipient has marked, whether he likes it or not, VG, please do not send again. Here he's got in front of a bottle of Bob and a tin of tobacco. So they're, they're quite well catered for. Even so, most soldiers enjoyed less fanciful fare. The staple diet for uh, the soldier in the trenches was bully beef, which is literally corned beef, and that arrived in tins. You got that virtually every day. This material was used to give the army food a bit of flavor. But just as trench life became more bearable, a new weapon found its way into the shelters. Mustard gas was a deadly chemical that could seep into the dugouts, attacking trench fighters where they slept. Delivered in explosive shells, mustard gas was an oily brown liquid that would turn into gas. It was especially dangerous if men in cold conditions had got splashed with this stuff and then went underground into a dugout, and this happened several times. It, in the cold, it did not turn into gas. It was still liquid on your clothes. When you got underground in a warm atmosphere, yeah, it turned to gas, and the whole dugout full of men could have been gassed. Oh, get up, you got gas on you. Oh, my god. It turned that quickly from liquid to gas, and it could gas a whole dugout full of men. And on, particularly on the soft parts of your body, it just ate through your body. If you inhaled it, it ate out of your body from the inside. It would get into your lungs and eat its way out of your body. Uh, th and this was by far the most lethal form of gas. In 1917 and 1918, thousands died from the effects of mustard gas. Gas cases are terrible. They cannot breathe lying down or sitting up. Their lungs are gone, literally burnt out. Some have their eyes and faces eaten away by gas and their body covered in first degree burns. One boy today screaming to die, the entire top layer of his skin burnt from face and body. I gave him an injection of morphine. When will it end? Nurse Shirley Millard. Archaeologists will look for the answer in the trenches as Peter Barton goes in search of the sites of a little-known chapter in the war. We must ignore what we see on the surface here and dive into another dimension, a dimension which is beneath our feet. The war in the tunnels. On the outskirts of Ypres, Belgium, a farmer's field is revealing the weapons, structures, and artifacts of the First World War. In 1916, it seemed this was a war no one would win. But in a nearby field, there is evidence of a deadly solution. Historian Peter Barton goes looking for its traces. When we look at these battlefields, we must ignore what we see on the surface here and dive into another dimension, a dimension which is beneath our feet. Planners on both sides of the line enlisted a new breed of soldier, the underground tunneler. It was the most barbaric form of warfare on the Western Front. And as I say, it was endless, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. 
Underground tunneling and mining became a complex battle tactic. You sank a shaft in your own trench. You dug under no man's land at various depths. A tunnel big enough to work in, maybe five feet high, four feet wide. You dug that tunnel as quietly as you possibly could so that the enemy could not hear you digging the tunnel. You dug out a chamber once you were underneath his trenches. You filled that with explosive and at a chosen time, usually in conjunction with, a, uh, with an infantry attack or a raid, you blow that mine. Those people who are directly in line with it would be vaporized or buried or blown out of their trenches into no man's land. They were literally blown out. And that would allow your attacking infantry force to take that front line trench much more easily. By 1916, a vast honeycomb of mining galleries and tunnels lay beneath the Ypres salient. The curious thing about these tunneling companies was that they were formed not from soldiers, but they were formed from civilians. And the first tunneling company were formed from men who'd been working in the sewers of Manchester on a Thursday. And the following Monday, they were working in France and Flanders. No military training. They couldn't even salute. They were given a rifle. It was taken off them straight away because they thought that they'd shoot each other. But they'd not come here to fight. They'd come to dig, and they all knew that. Even today, the scars of collapsed tunnels can be seen on the surface of Flanders fields. Here's a good example of a, a recent collapse. You can see, because there's no vegetation grown around the hole, it's a fairly recent one. And if we were to uh, hire a machine here and just dig straight down here, we go straight into the Canadian tunnels, which were dug in 1916. This kind of crown hole is evident throughout the whole of the Ypres salient. It's more prevalent up here because of the sandiness of the ridge, but wherever you go, you'll find collapses, some big, some small. Farmers have lost tractors in these. They regularly lose cows. They're standing there, and they disappear underground. As each side tried to tunnel under the enemy, detecting and destroying enemy tunneling became a deadly craft. If you picked up a German tunnel coming in your direction and found out exactly where it was. That gave you a huge advantage. So you could let them carry on digging, listening to them all the time, tracking their progress, until they got to the point where you calculated that it was a risk. And at that point, this is where the, the, uh, the barbarity comes into this the primitive warfare. If one or the other heard his opponent working, the direction and level was obtained, and a torpedo was set in a hole bored by a special borer, the angle of the hole set to the correct position to strike his workings, and wired back to an exploder. Canadian miner, Lieutenant John Westacott. At a chosen point, you decided, now we blow. You run your wires back. You blow that 100-pound charge. You murdered those men. In the summer of 1916 here, the Germans made a massive attempt to capture this ground. The tunnelers who were underground at that time knew there was something going on. But when they came up from their spell of work in the morning, they came up into the, what was their front line, and it was full of Germans. They'd taken the trench during the night. Nobody had told the tunnelers. The Germans saw the, the Canadian tunnelers and dived back down the shafts, chasing them after them. 
Lieutenant John Westacott was there. We were equipped with revolvers and grenades, but the best weapon of all underground workings was a specially made knife with a blade about five inches long, which was fitted to a brass frame over our hand. This weapon was silent in action. For 24 hours, they fought hand to hand with grenades, with bayonets, with rifles, anything they could fight with. The England are missing here, son. Sick in our game. Ah! Get out! Get out! Get out! There's another one right there! Go! 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 Hundreds of men died in the tunnels. Some are still there. This memorial here is marking, uh, in, immediately within this area where we are now, 13 men who were killed underground. 90 years later, the men still lie where they died, entombed in their tunnels. In the spring of 1916, 20,000 tunnelers began the largest underground mining operation in history, the earthquaking of Messine Ridge. Held by the Germans since 1914, Messine Ridge was little more than a series of hilltops. But from here, the Germans could observe and fire on Allied troops all over the salient. One of the most important points on Messine Ridge was a hummock known as Hill 60. Whereas another one of those places in the salient which was absolutely key for observation, Hill 60. And when you're on top of the hill looking back towards Ypres over there, you get this fantastic panoramic view. If you're on top looking the other direction, you would have got a panoramic view of the German line. So the Germans wanted to keep it, we wanted to take it. The idea was nothing less than to blow Hill 60 and much of the Messine Ridge to oblivion. Over almost two years of clandestine work, a honeycomb of tunnels was dug under the Germans on the ridge. Long tunnels burrowed hundreds of yards behind enemy lines. At the end of these, large underground chambers were packed with explosives right under the Germans. The favored explosive by the tunnels was something called Aminal. It was designed specifically for its lifting effect. It was a medium explosive. High explosive would make a sharp crack to break a, a railway line, if you like. Low explosive, like gunpowder, is too slow to lift these massive amounts of earth from 100 feet down here, for instance. Millions of tons of earth. As work continued underground, German soldiers manning the hills had no idea that tons of Aminal explosives were planted below their feet. It could take six weeks, day and night, to load. There wasn't a gap anywhere. In total, 19 charges were laid along the ridge. At Hill 60, tunnels two miles long were built to deliver the explosives. So by dawn on June the 7th, 1917, every one of these 19 charges was in, in place. Part of the, the biggest explosive charge ever planted in history. Just after midnight on June 7th, Allied commanders launched the most powerful preliminary bombardment of the war. Then, at 3.10 a.m., the mines were triggered. What followed was the largest man-made explosion up to that point in history. A cataclysmic blast heard as far away as London. 25,000 Germans were instantly atomized or buried alive. The detonation of the mines dramatically changed the landscape. What we see here is the Caterpillar Crater. 
This is 70,000 pounds of amnel planted 110 feet below the ground. It's actually a mass grave. It's not just a crater, it's a mass grave. 800 men died in this explosion alone and they're still beneath our feet today. Just minutes after the detonations, 150,000 Allied troops surged up the ridge into air thick with blood and dust. When the infantry took this uh, area after the mines had gone up, they found all the pillboxes still in the front edge of the wood there, all fully garrisoned. Every single man was dead, killed by concussion. And the trenches, again fully garrisoned, had done that and crushed them. They found the men just standing upright, crushed to death. The two trench sides had, had come together. The explosions enabled the Allies to move forward 3,000 yards, capturing 10 miles of the ridge. It was the first major success in three years. At the dig site, archaeologists are about to find clues to the last bloody days in these trenches. I shouldn't be this close to this shell. Uh, it scares the living daylights out of me, quite honestly. In Flanders fields, archaeologists have just two days left to find clues to the last dramatic days of these trenches. For three years, this was home to hundreds of thousands of soldiers. But in 1917, the mining of Messine Ridge by the Allies began a new stage in the war. The next step was to launch a massive infantry offensive. It would be known as the Third Battle of Ypres. And it would be launched from these very trenches. What we've got here is the topsoil on the top, where we've got about half a meter of topsoil. And then coming down here, we start hitting a different color. And this color is purely there because this is the remnants of metal in the First World War, most of which came from the sky. It's shell fire. Because of the, the intensity of that shell fire, the First World War has actually become a geological feature. In the weeks before the Third Battle of Ypres, the Allies launched a fierce artillery attack against the Germans. The enemy retaliated, and 90 years later, there are many deadly reminders at the Allied trench site. So for some reason, this one hasn't gone off, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't go off in the future. If someone came along and gave that a big knock, that could very easily explode, go bang, and we would all be blasted to pieces where we stand now. So uh, I'm uh, very close to oblivion here. The war's great killer, artillery, was becoming even more efficient with developments like the Gray's fuse. But as soon as that shell even touched the ground, it would explode on the surface of the ground, and the splinters, steel splinters from that shell, would all fly sideways. The kind of damage which these things could do would simply, men would simply cease to exist. They would just disappear. For instance, on a misty morning, you could be left just with a mist of blood in the air. This is the kind of thing which could happen with these massive shells. But not all explosives work as they should. What we've got here is the tail of a high explosive projectile known as a toffee apple. On the top of here, you would have had an explosive head about the size of a football. Um, this is fired from a trench mortar. Uh, the problem is they, they, they had a distressing habit when they exploded. The tail would, would fly back towards her, your own lines on the same trajectory as the, as the thing had been fired in the first place. Um, 
Infantry didn't like trench mortar crews because these guys would um, arrive in your section of the trench, they'd loose four or five rounds at the enemy, then they'd disappear before the counter-battery fire arrived. Even though the Allies had managed to hang on to the city of Ypres, it was still within range of German artillery. Over three years, the city was slowly pulverized. By 1917, Ypres had been reduced to rubble. Soldiers became expert in identifying the different kinds of incoming enemy shells. And the names that the troops gave to the shells often came from the sound of the shell in flight um, and the explosion itself. The name Jack Johnson was given to a big black shell burst because of the, the black boxer called Jack Johnson, Johnson uh, who, who was uh, around at that time. So the, the names of these shells, whiz bangs, for example, the high velocity German field gun shell, the whiz on the bang of the explosion happened very, very quickly next to each other. By 1917, shelling was approaching its zenith. And to support this, industry around the world was churning out a devastating volume of munitions. In July 1917 alone, the Allies fired over four million shells into German positions. It was the deafening prelude to the Third Battle of Ypres. The whole place was nothing but a mass of bursting shells. The deadly sound as they exploded and the awful vibrations was followed, trying the nerves of everyone around. Quite a few had to be taken away with shell shock. During the time this barrage was taking place, shrapnel was flying around in all directions. Private John F. Moore. Shell blast could cause death by concussion at 10 yards, rupturing spleen and kidneys, leaving no marks on the body. The effect of shelling could be utterly devastating upon the, the nervous system. People simply broke down at shelling. Shell shock. There are many times uh, you find reports of people becoming literally gibbering wrecks. Uh, but everyone has a different threshold. Some people could stand it just that bit longer. <laughs> Shell shock took a terrible toll. By the end of the war, 30,000 men had gone mad. People could simply fall apart and never recover. It's only three years since the last veteran died who'd been in a home for the whole of his life. He never got over being shelled. Under this metallic thunder, 300,000 men prepared to charge out of their trenches. Three weeks of artillery fire and rain had transformed no man's land into a quagmire. Conditions were poor, but the generals would wait no longer. On July 31st, 1917, soldiers readied themselves to go over the top into a certain hail of steel and bullets. Frederick Noakes describes his final moments before scrambling over the top. I think that half hour was probably the worst I have ever spent. Private Frederick Elias Noakes. From the records, we know precisely what happened just before the attack on July the 31st, 1917. They had a cup of tea and they had sausages and potatoes before they went over the top. I suspect uh, a, tea, a tablespoonful of rum might have followed. And then it was a question of saying potential goodbyes. Most soldiers felt that going over the top was the greatest test any man would ever face. As time went past, apprehension became acute as I weighed my chances for surviving the attack. No, I could not so easily give up. 
The grip of life on me was tightening, and more than ever, I wanted to live. Liaison officer, Paul Lucien Mays. And then when the whistle blew, it's these very trenches which they climbed out of into the machine gun fire. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war. The exact death toll has never been established. 68,000 men are thought to have been wounded or killed. In spite of huge losses, over the next four months, Allied soldiers advance as far as Passchendaele. Allies again dig into trenches, but not for long. Soldiers in 1918 would witness the arrival of new tactics and technology that would finally defeat the trenches. In Flanders fields, an historic dig is coming to an end. Belgium's winter is about to set in, but nothing can dampen the archaeologist's sense of achievement. In just two weeks, they have uncovered two entire frontline trenches and found more artifacts than many thought was possible. The trenches will soon be filled in again, laid to rest once more under farmers' crops. Some people say, well, it's not worth it. You know, you're doing all the effort to get all the trenches clear, to get all the things between the A-frames, and then you're just covering it. So why are you doing it? Well, I think it's, it's really worth the effort. That's, that's how we do archaeology. The dig site has revealed evidence of each stage of trench warfare. In the British trench, duck boards and A-frames. Part of the ingenious architecture of a fortress built in often sodden ground. Yeah, what the archaeologists have done here is, has got a pair of scissors and just cut through the ribbon of the Western Front. And this little tiny excavation is that little cut. The dig uncovered clues that explain why soldiers first dug these trenches. Trenches simply appeared in this landscape because men had to take cover from steel, from bullets and from shrapnel. It's as simple as that. For three years, there was no way to break the stalemate. Gas attacks, sniping, trench raids, artillery fire, every tactic failed. And the price of those failures is revealed at the German trench site. Here, archaeologists find mostly rubble and signs of explosions. Few personal effects are left unscathed. But in 1918, the last year of the war, the riddle of how to break the stalemate was finally solved. New primitive tanks burst through even the sturdiest trench lines. And precision bombing blew strongholds to pieces. When the war finally ended, the trenches were filled in. In wars to come, generals try to avoid trenches, now synonymous with stalemate. But soon, the few First World War soldiers who are still with us will pass away. This dig is being done at a time when there's a handful of First World War veterans still left alive. There's four in Britain, there's four in Germany, three in Australia. The First World War is, we're right on that point where the First World War is passing from memory into history, and we can never go back again. 
As these last veterans pass away, the artifacts they left behind will be the only reminders of what happened here. Objects that speak across the generations. On the last day of the dig, November 11th, the archaeologists share their findings with the people of Flanders before entrusting them to museums around the world. You just think about the people who were there and the sacrifices they made, and exactly the same on the other side of No Man's Land as well. It's no longer them and us, it's no longer British against German, it's just a slice of history which means so much to people from all over the world even today. In time, the soldiers' names will fade. So it's, it's difficult to put it into words, really. It's a great privilege. It, it's something you'll never forget. And it makes you feel extremely humble and lucky that in the decades of my life, I've never had to go to war. Millions of men lived and died in the trenches of World War I, and many of their bodies still lie here, buried beneath Flanders fields. But thanks to the archaeologists, their sacrifice will not be forgotten.